Hi everybody, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a librarian here at the LSC Tomball Community Library. Welcome back to Screenshots, which is the series where I recommend to you great movies that you can watch for free with your library card. Now, I may be a librarian today, but in my previous life, I was a theater kid. I grew up on theater, particularly Broadway musicals, and I still have a huge soft spot for them to this day. But I found that if you didn't grow up with musicals, they can be kind of tough to get into. If you don't live somewhere with a robust live theater scene, most of your exposure to musicals probably comes in the form of movie musical adaptations, and they are not all created equal. Particularly after the legendary flop that was Tom Hooper's 2019 adaptation of Cats, I fear that a lot of people were scared off of musicals entirely. So I am here to bring my expertise to help you get into movie musicals with my recommendations of four great movie musicals that you can watch for free with your library card. So. Let's get started. Even though they dominated the American film industry in the beginning and the middle of the 20th century, movie musicals are tough to do well. Like adapting a book, things that began their lives on the stage look, feel, and function differently from movies, so a lot can be lost in adaptation. Which is why we're going to start things off safe here with a musical that began its life on the screen, Joss Whedon's 2008 miniseries Dr. Horrible's Sing Along Blog. Yes, I said miniseries, and yes, I said Joss Whedon. Split into three episodes, the entire series caps out at just under an hour in total runtime, which is a good place to get into musicals if you find yourself a little wary of the monolithic runtimes of old Broadway standards like Phantom of the Opera or Les Miserables. The plot follows amateur supervillain Dr. Horrible, played by stage and screen standby Neil Patrick Harris, as he tries to woo nonprofit worker Penny while also trying to get certified as an official supervillain through the Evil League of Evil. Even though he's a villain, Dr. Horrible manages to save Penny from danger, but his actions get misattributed to the jerky superhero Captain Hammer, played by Joss Whedon mainstay Nathan Fillion series is a loving send-up of superhero media, with Dr. Horrible being probably the nicest supervillain around, while Captain Hammer is just wonderfully annoying. <laughs> the music is jaunty and insanely catchy, pulling from everywhere from the golden age of Broadway to hard rock and even country. Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog is going to be absolutely delightful for musical fans, superhero fans, Joss Whedon fans, or really just anybody who enjoys a good time. You can check out Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. Common complaint that I hear from non-musical fans is that musicals take themselves really seriously. And while there are definitely some that play things pretty serious and tackle some big subject matter, there are just as many, if not more, that are poppy, accessible, and super funny. One of the funniest, in my opinion, is Frank Oz's 1986 classic, Little Shop of Horrors. Now made in the 80s, Little Shop of Horrors is set in the early 1960s in the fictional New York City neighborhood of Skid Row. It follows nerdy florist Seymour, who is in love with his coworker Audrey, who is unfortunately in an abusive relationship with a greaser dentist played by Steve Martin. However, after coming into possession of a mysterious plant during a solar eclipse, Seymour finds that he is finally able to make his dreams come true. Because in exchange for human blood, the plant, nicknamed Audrey II, will grant Seymour's wishes, thus beginning Seymour's rampage across Skid Row. All of this is set to this wonderful Motown-inspired soundtrack. And like other Motown-inspired musical Hairspray, Little Shop of Horrors did not begin its life as a movie musical. Instead, it was originally a sci-fi B-movie, until it was scooped up by musical writers Alan Menken and Howard Ashman in the early 80s. That B-movie schlock is still there, but Menken and Ashman add this interesting layer of self-awareness to it as well, 
So the finished product ends up being equal parts wonderfully dumb, surprisingly smart, and genuinely touching. Whatever the reason, Little Shop of Horrors is a definite crowd pleaser, and you can check it out on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. If you enjoyed Dr. Horrible and Little Shop, then I think you're pretty well acclimated to most of the things that musicals can throw at you. So I think we can up the ante just a little bit. Most people will agree that the golden age of the movie musical ended sometime around the 1960s, but every now and again there will be a rare one that manages to break through against all odds. And one great example of that is Bob Fosse's 1972 film adaptation of his own musical, Cabaret. Any other year, Cabaret probably would have won Best Picture at the Oscars, but it had the misfortune of being nominated the same year as The Godfather. But it still won absolute buckets of awards, actually earning it the honor of being the film with the most Oscar wins without also winning Best Picture. And it's no surprise why. As a musical on its own, Cabaret is fantastic. Based on the short stories of the writer Christopher Isherwood, who is living in Berlin in the days leading up to World War II, the musical follows one of Isherwood's characters, the cabaret dancer Sally Bowles, a freewheeling American expat living it up in Berlin during the heyday of the Weimar Republic. Much of the film and most of the musical numbers take place in the cabaret club that Sally dances at, the Kit Kat Club, and the music has this dark, jazzy kind of vibe that I've really never encountered from another musical. Cabaret is also renowned for having one of the most legendary tonal shifts in musical history, beginning in the freewheeling final days of the Weimar Republic, but ending in the throes of Nazi Germany. The musical and the film adaptation both are wonderful artifacts of the ways that fascism ruins lives, but also of the ways that art can serve as both an escape from those troubles and a tool actually to change the world, either for good or for bad. This is my personal favorite musical, and the film, which Fosse directed, is also excellent in ways that are unique from the stage production, particularly the cinematography, which is shot in these really unsettling low angles that make most of the film feel like a bad dream. But even if it's a nightmare, Cabaret is uniquely stylish and just absolutely incredible. You can check Cabaret out on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. I've been into musicals for most of my life, so I've been able to see certain trends come and go. And one that was particularly popular a few years ago is the Jukebox musical. Jukebox musicals don't write original music like most musicals do, instead taking pre-existing music, often popular music, and using that to construct a story around. This has been done with pretty mixed results historically, but one of the very best jukebox musicals also happens to be one of the oldest, 1964's A Hard Day's Night. The pop star movie vehicle has largely fallen out of fashion, but A Hard Day's Night was probably the greatest height that the genre ever reached, following The Beatles yes, the actual Beatles playing themselves, sort of, through a fictionalized version of a very long day in their actual lives. The results are very British and very 60s, but this movie has a unique kind of self-awareness to it that a lot of other pop star movies just don't have. And it's still pretty funny, 60 years nearly after it was released, albeit in a Monty Python sort of way. <laughs> Obviously though, the standout feature of this film is the music, which is the album A Hard Day's Night in its entirety. It's pretty hard to conceive of one of the most iconic pop albums ever originally being the soundtrack to a movie musical, but that is exactly what it was. And this film is unusual in a number Number of ways. Firstly, the crew was pretty upfront about the fact that it was a blatant cash grab, but they put a surprising amount of work into still making it good. It was shot in a cinema verite style inspired by the French New Wave, and it features a surprising cross-section of the British public at the time, including George Harrison's future wife Patty Boyd and the future Genesis frontman Phil Collins. 
This film really had no right to be as good as it is, and Andrew Saris of The Village Voice famously called it the Citizen Kane of jukebox musicals. And you know, he might just be right. You can check out A Hard Day's Night on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. Thank you for watching this episode of Screenshots. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter so that you never miss a future episode of Screenshots or any of our other great online programs. If I miss your personal favorite movie musical, please let me know. I am constantly trying to evangelize these to people and it's always nice to have a few extra ones up my sleeve. So thank you again for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.